My name is Bruno Borges. I work for Microsoft in the Java engineering group. And Microsoft has a Java team. <laughs> <laughs> and that is as crazy as it gets. Um, I joined Microsoft in 2018 in the developer relations group. And then uh, about a year and a half after that, Microsoft realized, oh, we actually run a lot of Java inside the company. Maybe we should have a Java team. And then that's where uh, uh, we formed the Java Engineering Group, where we focus on uh, optimizing Java inside Microsoft. And then whatever we find, optimizations and lessons and opportunities to enhance OpenJDK and Java, we bring that upstream to the project. So, for example, you may have seen that Microsoft build of OpenJDK is now a JDK that you can download and install and use in your computer. Microsoft build of OpenJDK, as weird as it gets, runs on Mac OS. We also build OpenJDK. Microsoft builds Java for Mac OS. We uh, helped implement OpenJDK for macOS on the M1 chipsets, the, the Apple Silicon, which is uh, closer, very close to the ARM specification. And um, we do have binaries for Windows, of course, and we also have binaries for Windows ARM. In fact, the Windows ARM binaries for OpenJDK were developed first and then that code was used to help build binaries for Apple Silicon, Microsoft, Java, Mac OS. So it's all weird, but it's cool. Uh, and by the way, uh, folks who are standing out, there are some seats open in the front. You're more than welcome to come. There are three seats, four seats around here, four or five seats, four, more than like eight seats on this side over here. Take your time. Um, and yeah, Microsoft runs about, today we estimate we run about two million JVMs inside Microsoft. Two million instances of JVMs. A good chunk of those JVMs are running LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has a backend implemented in Java. Um, Bing, who uses Bing? Occasionally. Who uses Windows? Okay, who uses Windows here? Okay, you all use Bing. You just don't know. <laughs> so if you're on Windows 11, I think, and you hit the window key and the start menu shows up, there are web results based on what you type there. That is running Bing. Those web results from Windows are from Bing queries. And which means you use Java because at the end of the day, Bing servers have indexes running on Java technology. Azure infrastructure also has some Java components. When you provision a new resource on Azure, a new VM, that message will navigate over Azure infrastructure, data centers and queues and lists and whatever. There's some Kafka over there. There's some Apache Spark. There's some components that were implemented in Java in the back end. So Java's success is important for Microsoft because we rely a lot on it. Who plays Minecraft? A few hands up. Who has kids who play Minecraft? More hands up, nice. That's Java, right? And believe it or not, we are shipping the Microsoft build of OpenJDK, the binary by Microsoft of Java with Minecraft now. So if your kid is running the latest version of Minecraft and you are a Java professional, it's very likely that your kid is running the latest version of Java, Java 17, on their computer while you, shame on you, still running Java 8 in production at work. <laughs> okay? Yeah, ask your kid how to upgrade. 
All right. Tomorrow, there will be a talk by uh, my friend Brian Benz on Java at Microsoft with more details. I gave you a big summary, but you can uh, join that talk tomorrow to learn more. Today, we're going to talk about JVM ergonomics running and running on Kubernetes. Who runs Java on Kubernetes here? Too many of you. Who likes YAML? Too many hands up. Okay, so running Java inside Kubernetes has many gotchas, and that's what this talk is about, especially when it comes to how do you enhance performance, right? So first things first, we're gonna talk about a little bit of ergonomics, then garbage collectors, and then Java and Kubernetes, actually. Because to understand Java and Kubernetes and the nuances of running Java and Kubernetes, it's important to understand the runtime. And the runtime is the hotspot JVM. So let's talk about ergonomics. How many garbage collectors are available in an open JDK distribution on average? Who believes it's two? I'm asking you, forget about the poll here. That will, I will show you the actual answer. The answer is not, uh, uh, it's not indicating that more than four is the answer. That's the result from a Twitter poll. That's what people on Twitter believe. I'll give you the right answer after that. So I'm asking you now, how many JVM garbage collectors are there in OpenJDK? Who believes it's two? One hand, two, a few hands up. Who believes it's three? Okay, who believes it's four? Okay, and who believes it's more than four? Okay, so the right answer is more than four. Do you expect that the JVM will choose the best garbage collector for your application based on what ergonomics, on what resources available in the machine? Who believes it's just CPU? So the JVM will look at how many CPUs are available and then make a selection of a garbage collector. And you know that there are more than four. The JVM will start. You don't set what garbage collector should be used. The JVM has to make a selection, right? So the JVM will look at what resources? Who believes it's just the CPU that the JVM will look at? One hand. Who believes it's memory that the JVM will look at? And who believes it's CPU and memory? Okay. Yeah, 2.3% of people are just crazy. But yes, it is CPU and memory. How many garbage collectors do you think the JVM will consider based on CPU and memory to make a selection? You know there are more than four. You know the JVM will look at the number of CPUs and how much memory is available and then make a selection. Will the JVM consider all the garbage collectors that exist inside the hotspot JVM? Who believe it's all? Who believe it's between two garbage collectors? Who believes it's between three garbage collectors? Oh, yeah, who believes it's between three? And who doesn't have no idea? <laughs> okay, great, welcome to this talk. This is what this is about. It's actually only between two garbage collectors. Do you trust JVM ergonomics to pick the right garbage collector, the best garbage collector? And as you can see, some people are like, yes, always, and yes, until now. And then some people never trusted, and they're, and they're like, I didn't know about this thing. So you see that the information is important. You know, it's important to understand the runtime. It's important to understand how the JVM works. And the garbage collector is an important component of the runtime. Who here would like better JVM ergonomics? Why aren't you all raising the hand? Well, probably you're on in the whatever, yeah, whatever. Fair enough. Um, and then we started asking questions to people. We asked like, hey, uh, how many CPUs are you using inside your containers? And the majority of people are running containers with two CPUs only. 
And then there's a bunch of people with one CPU. And some people that are like, they run stuff that they know or they think it's big, like running Kafka on Kubernetes or Spark on Kubernetes. And then they're like, oh, I need more CPU in this thing because it's Kafka. So Kafka is huge and needs lots of CPUs, right? So that's why there are like four CPUs. There are actually even more. Some people responded like eight CPUs uh, and so on. So we went to a, uh, an APM partner and uh, we asked them, hey, can you help us understand Java across you know, production environments? Because there's a difference between asking people on Twitter at random and ver versus actually looking at data in production. And this is what is interesting. The majority, more than, more than half, 62% of the JVMs being monitored in production by this APM vendor, millions of JVMs across different customers around the globe, different data centers, different cloud providers, more than half, 62% are running inside containers. So Java inside containers is a big thing. So you, we all should know that. But look on the right side the majority are running one processor, one CPU for their Java processes. But then when you look, start looking at the garbage collection selection, you realize people have no idea what garbage, garbage collector is in use on Kubernetes. They are either not setting, which is the, uh, the I'm bad with colors, and if you're color blind, it's even worse, I know. Uh, but it's like the biggest on the chart at the bottom left, that shows the bigger color on the right side of the circle. That shows JVMs that go unconfigured. No JVM explicitly selected by the developer. So the developer is expecting the garbage collector to be selected by the JVM. And as we have learned, that selection is not that great. So how does the JVM select the garbage collector? It will look into CPU and memory. By default, the JVM, we all have learned that the default garbage collector in the JVM is the G1 GC. And that is true, except when it's running with one processor or less than 1,792 megabytes of available physical memory. It's not the heap size. It's about the availability of memory in the environment. So I prefer personally to say that the default garbage collector in the JVM, because we are all in this containerized world now, I personally like to say that the default is serial GC and that G1 GC will only be used inside containers if you are running with two processors and 1,792 megabytes of memory at least available for that container. Sure, you can manually, explicitly set G1 GC. This is about default selection when you just do like Java minus dollar or Spring Boot and the JVM will pick a garbage collector and this is how it does. But inside a container, there's an algorithm inside the, the hotspot JVM that when it's running inside a container, it will evaluate how many processors are available. And this algorithm can also be overridden by a flag, active processor count. So you can manually set, tell the JVM, hey JVM, you have two processors, even when you are running a container with one processor. So you can, you can do that uh, trick. And uh, the way that the JVM will count is based on uh, CPU quota, CPU period, CPU time, all these flags that are very common in the Kubernetes world. And we're gonna see more about that later. To make things worse, in OpenJDK 11, there's a bug at the moment that will be updated this month with the, the next uh, patch set update. If you are running OpenJDK 11 on a C groups version two environment, which is some Kubernetes environment out there, 
the JVM does not respect the limits of CPUs set to that container. So if you do like, if you set your resources for your Kubernetes deployment and you say two processors only, the JVM ignores them because of this bug with cgroups v2. And if the node has four processors or eight or 32, the JVM will read that amount of the host. Which is why some people are seeing the JVM running inside containers on Kubernetes with G1 GC, even though the limit of CPU is one processor. Does that make sense? Perfect. This bug was fixed in JDK 15, so it's been fixed uh, since JDK 15, but it's only being backported by Oracle to OpenJDK 11 this month, this patch. So let's, let's do a quick demo and see how things are working with garbage collection ergonomics. So I have this code here that will print JVM processor count, JVM heap size, and whether it's using G1 GC or serial GC. So you've learned the information, now let's test you I'm running a container here with one core and one gigabyte of RAM. Is it gonna use serial GC or, or G1 GC? Serial GC. This container is only one gigabyte of RAM and I did not set the heap size and I did not give you this information yet. This is another quiz. This information is given in a future slide when I wanna test you now. I did not set explicitly the heap size. What will be the heap size here? Anybody has any idea? You have a hand up? Sorry? 25%? Okay, 25%. Anybody disagrees with 25%? No? Okay. So, when you run a container with one, gig, one gigabyte of RAM and only one core and the application runs, the JVM does identify here one processor. And by the way, it will always identify because this is running on, on Docker locally and Docker in this environment is running with cgroups version one. So it, I, won't, I won't demo you that bug with cgroups. That's like kind of new information. I don't have a demo for that. But the heap size is 25%. That is the default. One quarter of available, available memory in the environment is used for heap size if you don't set the heap size. You know, X and max flag. But as you can see, yes, use serial GC, true, and use G1 GC, false. Okay, now we have one core with two gigabytes of RAM. Now, if we do the math, the heap size will be 500 megabytes, roughly. And will it use serial GC or G1 GC? Serial. That is true. Now two cores and one gigabyte of RAM. It will do 247 megabytes heap, serial GC true, G1 GC false. And then with two cores, two gigabyte of RAM, use G1 GC. So here's the interesting thing. If I do docker run CPUs to memory uh, 200 megabytes 2,000 2, megabytes, not two gig. As you know, two gig is not 2,000 megabytes. It's 2,024, uh, 48, sorry, right? What do you, wait, wait, Ben, why are you, why are you shaking your head? Oh, 
It's 2000. Oh wow, Ben. Shame on me. What was the thing? No, so I cannot figure out how to show you, but I will, t I will tell you. This thing about uh, which garbage collector is so old in the hotspot JVM code that there is a big comment in it that says, if the, if the machine is running on, why, let me go back to the slides. Why is it 17 and 92 megabytes? That's the question, right? The reason for that is on the hotspot JVM, on the OpenJDK project source code, there is a, 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 a selection of available memory, but that available memory on the comment it says two gigabytes of RAM discounted 256 megabytes that the code expects is being used for a graphic card. So that's why it's 792 megabytes. And it's just there since Java 1.5, I think. And, you know, it's very old code. But I, I couldn't figure out how to show you that. My apologies. So when we, when we at Microsoft like, thought, okay, we need to provide some guidance to developers. I mean, the, clearly the starting point of the JVM is not that great if you, the developer is not explicitly setting the heap size, explicitly setting the garbage collector. So we came up with a table that kind of gives you an idea of what garbage collector to use in kind of what scenario. So if you're running with one core, it's serial GC. If you're running with two cores or more, and based on the amount of memory that you have and based on the type of the workload, we kind of suggest you use parallel GC or use G1 GC or use ZGC or even Shenandoah. In, in general, so just both ZGC and Shenandoah are very kind of for like special cases, so you have to really benchmark your application to figure out if, it's, if it makes sense to use it. But for microservices, the, the usual stuff that we tend to deploy to Kubernetes, like microservices, Spring Boot apps, Quarkus app, Micronaut out apps, you know, MicroProfile, whatever, things like that, it's basically either parallel GC or G1 GC. And if you want throughput of all things, Parallel GC is actually better than G1 GC, in general. I always will say this, in general. You, you can maybe say, well, but my case is different. Yes, you should benchmark. You should do performance tuning exercises in your application to identify what is best for your application. But if you have no idea, and you don't even know how to do performance exercise, and your, your customer, your manager is asking, we need to put this thing in production tomorrow, well, you have, you have a, a starting point. And that's, this, that, that's the thing that we are trying to recommend here. Um, let me skip this slide here, because uh, I think we, have, we want to get into the Kubernetes part. And, and you all know really well what you know, heap size is and how garbage collection works. D4 ergonomics, as we've learned, a quarter of available memory if it's inside a container, and if it's not inside a container, it's 164 of available memory. Like you have a VM with you know, one terabyte of RAM, the, the JVM will by default use 164 of available memory as the heap size. Now the interesting thing that for containers, we actually suggest that if you're running 11 or later, you use the auto flag max RAM percentage and set a percentage of, av of available memory in the container as the heap size. This means that if your pod if you configure your pod to scale vertically, because Kubernetes has vertical pod scalers, your, your JVM heap size will also scale, and you don't have to reconfigure or do math on shell scripts or whatever. You just use that flag in your uh, Docker file, 
instead of you know, uh, uh, doing, doing math manually and using J, um, XMX. And XMX is a, a static value you have to provide. So I, I, I like to put this comment on, on, on Monica, back with who works with us. GC20 is basically trying to optimize the, the object moving as little as possible, as late as possible, so as not to disturb the flow. The flow of what? The application. And why, why, why garbage collection tuning is so important? Because you all are constraining the JVM. You all are running Java inside containers with little CPU, little memory but you're not tuning the garbage collector. You're not doing the right selection. You're not giving enough memory. You're not identifying whether your application needs more memory or needs more CPU. But the garbage collector is an important component. Who here improves performance of your systems? Adding more memory or CPU? <laughs> now, who does performance improvements adding more replicas? Kind of same number. I was expecting more hands up with more replicas, because that's what we see in general with Kubernetes deployments. Oh, my system is slow. Yeah, just add more replicas. Sure, it will work. Sure, adding more replicas to a distributed system will work. Your microservice will perform better, because now you're distributing the load. But how efficient is that? There are certain things on the hotspot JVM that are uh, 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 present in every instance. There's something, there's an area of the JVM called meta space. You, you all familiar with meta space? It's where the metadata goes, or like the classes, for example, that are loaded in memory. So if you have a class path that spans, consumes like 200 megabytes of memory for whatever reason, you are on every replica, you are consuming 200 megabytes of memory of the class path. The more replicas you add, the more memory you're wasting for that. But if you had less replicas with more memory, each replica will still have 200 megabytes, but now you have a bigger heap size for the application to operate and more CPU. So we learn about ergonomics and uh, garbage collectors. Uh, these slides are available on the internet and uh, uh, you can read the summary later. So let's talk about Java and Kubernetes, and we have 20 minutes. Okay, so on Kubernetes, there is this thing called uh, Mili cores, where you define how, how much CPU time is uh, available for a, a container. So you have your pod definition. Inside the pod definition, you have to define your containers. For each container, you give CPU allocation. Now, the CPU allocation is not and the number of CPUs available for that application. It's the amount of CPU time available for that application. And this is, this is an important distinction, understanding that you have to have. Even though the JVM would do some calculations uh, based on this information and convert that, there is uh, uh, nuances to it. So instead of you just reading the slide, I came up with this awesome animation in 3D that will show you what happens of your, on, on, when your application is running. And why somebody will look at the charts and look at the latency, and the latency is going super bad, and the throughput is just going crazy. Your application is being throttled by Kubernetes. Your application is being paused because it consumed all the CPU time uh, allocated to it. And now it has to wait for the next period of CPU then to resume processing. So here we have an application running on the JVM. And, we, and as we know, the garbage collector runs as a, has its own thread. And sometimes it has multiple threads. So here we have an application that received four HTTP requests. Now the interesting thing, as you saw, the four CPUs in the machine process the four requests at the same time, even though the CPU limit at the top says 1,000 millicore. But each request consumed 200 millicores. 
which is, let's say, roughly 20, 20 milliseconds. It, it spent 20 milliseconds. That was the time that those four HP requests took uh, um, combined. At, they all ran in parallel. Each HTTP request, they had to do stuff like go to the database, check for stuff, and then come back and give a response to the user. Each HTTP request took 40, 20 milliseconds, and they spent 200 millicore of CPU time. Now, here's the thing. Now, my Java application, that container, only has 200 millicore of CPU time available. But the CPU period, which is the, the, the time frequency of your application on Kubernetes, uh, or CFS, um, now it, all, it still has 80 milliseconds to wait until the next time to reset the time allowance for your, process, for your application on the CPU. But it's a managed runtime with its own garbage collector. And by the way, this also impacts .NET. And I've, I've learned from other folks in the Go community, this also impacts Go, because Go has their own garbage collector as well. Now the GC thread ran, and it consumed, combined, uh, uh, 200 millicore. Now this process, this container, has no more CPU time available. Zero millicore is available, it consumed all. But the, the CFS period still has 60 milliseconds uh, to wait, which means now the application is throttled. If there's any HTTP request coming in within this time window, it will be blocked. The application will not process that. And that's what CPU throttle means. And, my, and then you can say, well, let's just give more replicas. Sure, it does help, but it's not efficient unless you really know what's going on, where the bottleneck is. Is it I.O., is it CPU, is it memory, is it my application, is it the database, whatever. You have to know what the bottleneck is. But when the bottleneck is CPU throttling, just adding more replicas will solve the problem, but not as efficiently as it could. And by efficiency, I mean cost. It means spending more time, more, more money in the cloud than you, you could have. So the JVM has this thing. In general, if you give up to 1,000 millicore, the JVM thinks it's one processor available. If you give somewhere between 2,000 and 2,999, it thinks there are two processors available. Um, and and uh, sorry, yeah, 2,001 to 3,000, it's three processors available and so on. And as I showed you before, you can use the active processor account to overwrite this thing. So we also have this chart that kind of recommends, and I, I've heard stories like, oh, but I'm just a developer, I just push a Docker image, it's the ops team who sets the CPU resource limit. Well, let me tell you something. In the DevOps word, there is dev and ops. <laughs> So if the ops team is telling you, oh, we can only run stuff with a thousand millicore, well, the dev should be there talking to the ops team. Well, not really. It's a, it's a managed runtime that has garbage collectors. Here's why we need more CPU time, blah, 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 blah. And we have this rough recommendation as a starting point. I'm not saying this is the best recommendation for any application. I'm saying that if you have no idea what to use, use these values and start from here. So we did some test and this is a benchmark of a gRPC application. And what we concluded with this benchmark is that you can find with enough performance tuning and testing the sweet spot between horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. And this will vary per application. I'm not saying there is a sweet spot that uh, general, like, a, like diagonally scaling applications will be perfect, you know. But if you do the exercise, you can find this spot. And it's not about just giving more replicas. It's also about giving more resources, vertical scaling. So here, we ran an application with six containers 
giving one CPU per container. That's the green bar and the green line. Six replicas, 1,000 millicore each. Look at the latency, how bad it is. And the throughput is not that great. And then we thought, well, what if we redistributed those resources better? What if we gave 2,000 millicore to three replicas or 3,000 millicores to two replicas? I'm still spending 6,000 millicores. I do get better throughput, that's the red and the orange, the two bars in the middle, and I get better latency. But as you can see, the red line has the best latency. And the best latency because that's the CPU running with 3,000 millicore. That's the JVM, uh, that's the use case of two replicas with 3,000 millicore. You get the best result. But what if you could find a sweet spot where you get better performance, not necessarily the best performance, but you get better performance and you save money? That's the last scenario, the blue bar and the blue line in latency. That's two replicas with 2,000 millicore. In total, 4,000 millicore. You're saving 2,000 millicore to run other applications, other stuff, whatever. Now you have better latency, not the best, but much better than the green line. And you have better throughput, not the best, but better. So this is why performance tuning is so important. You can, without rewriting your application, without even tuning the JVM, you just redistribute the resources you already have in your Kubernetes cluster. You can save money. You can enhance customer experience, give better performance to your application. And that's why your conversation as Java experts with the ops team is so important. And this is how you can start that conversation. Let's imagine you have this scenario. A Kubernetes cluster, six VMs, each, the ops team says this crazy thing, oh, it's 1,000 millicore per application, I don't care. And this is what you end up with, your application with several replicas. Sometimes you have two or more replicas of the same application on the same node. Why do you have two or more replicas of the same application on the same node? Why don't you combine those resources? So instead of spending 200 megabytes in the meta space times every JVM, you only have one JVM, one meta space, and one garbage collector working. So in this scenario, I did some math, and the total cost of this environment would be an estimate of $180, $140. But if I did this, I would spend the same amount of money but I would have nine vCPUs available, or 9,000 millicores available in my, in my Kubernetes environment. So even though I'm not saving money in my actual billing, I'm saving money because I now have more resources available to something else without having to add another VM to my cluster. So have this conversation with the ops team, look into how you're deploying Kubernetes, and consider how do you find a sweet spot. And to, how to find a sweet spot, I have some ideas. This is one of them. You can do crazy stuff on Kubernetes. You can have a load balancer that sends, distributes the load to two other load balancers. And then what you can have is something like this. You have the, your front end, but you, redistribute, you distribute the load to a topology that has smaller JVMs with multiple replicas, which is what most people end up doing these days. But you have another topology in production that has larger JVMs and lesser, lesser replicas. And then you monitor that. You monitor that in production. You don't look at the JVM, you don't tune the JVM, just look at this. See if this gives you any indication that your application may actually perform better if you redistribute the resources differently. And if it does, then you have proof for your ops team that this could save money. But addressing actual performance issues is a, is a long term exercise. It's not a matter of days. It's not a matter of weeks. Sometimes it takes months to identify a performance bottleneck. 
You have to understand your stack. Oh, I'm running Java. Uh, I don't understand the JVM really well. You should, because it's a runtime. If you are learning Kubernetes and, you, and you're a Java developer and you still don't know the JVM, you should understand the JVM more than you understand Kubernetes. Because those nuances that we, we saw in the initial, in the beginning, those are critical to how your application will perform. Observe and analyze. Constantly monitor your application and uh, benchmark numbers. Whatever change you make, document those changes. Oh, on day X, we increased the heap size to blah, and now the, here's the telemetry of that. And benchmark that with different periods of time. There are some tools out there. Of course, I'm giving you some suggestions on uh, some Microsoft projects that we started. We have a JFR streaming, which uh, 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 is a library that you can connect. Some APM vendors are integrating this library with their solutions, and it's extracting JFR data, sending to their dashboards. So you can look at very specific JVM telemetry. And also extract garbage collection logs from your applications and then analyze them with tools that will give you signs of better, better heap sizing or better uh, uh, tuning for that particular garbage collector. Some garbage collectors have specific tuning uh, things that you can do, and uh, uh, the collection logs are the best source of information, what to do if you have to do something. And finally, as I, as I said, reorganize the resource that you already have. If, you have a, if your Kubernetes cluster has a bunch of VMs only with four cores, which is kind of common, Maybe consider using VMs with eight cores. At the end of the day, it's the same price in most cloud vendors if you remain on the same type of VM, but it has more cores. It's the same type of VM, just more cores. It will be the same cost, just you know, multiplied by the cores. But you are reducing the number of VMs. So your cost is the same. You have nodes with more core. It means you can deploy bigger containers. Not bigger, containers with more resources, more CPU and more memory. And hopefully, you're going to increase the performance and either maintain the cost or even reduce your billing. Because then you can realize, oh, we actually don't need 200 replicas. We only need five. And that, I've seen that happening. Well, not the 200 to five, but close. So uh, conclusion, different workloads, many different topologies. Uh, as we saw, I mean Kafka, who deploys Kafka with 1,000 core, 1,000 millicore? Nobody does, shouldn't <laughs> deploy Kafka instances with a 1,000 millicore limit. Um, so you know that. Um, give more resources to JVM in the beginning. Start, here's my personal suggestion, stop deploying containers with a 1,000 millicore. I know it doesn't apply to every source. I mean, if somebody says, oh, but I have this container running with three replicas at 500 millicore and it works great. Fine, stick with that. But if you don't have no idea, don't actually start with a thousand millicore. Just start with two, one replica. And if you, and by the way, this person who said, I have three replicas with 500 millicore, and the reason to that is because I deploy each replica on each different availability zones in the cloud, just in case the availability zone goes, you know, there's a power outage in the data center of that cloud provider. And I asked this person, how often does that happen? Well, in 15 years, never happened. So, okay. But if there is a requirement, sometimes there's like compliance requirements or whatever regulation, sometimes uh, people have to do that. You start with parallel GC for a small heap size. Even though, yeah, as, you, as you know, like G1 GC is the default on like 2,000 processors, two processors with 792 megabytes. Yeah, but if you, if you have like a microservice, you start with actually with the parallel GC, see how that goes. Uh, Parallel GC is good for throughput, and you know sometimes people focus more on throughput in general than latency, until latency is really really bad that they have to refocus on the latency. Um, and analyze data, understand your bottlenecks. So, scale out replicas, fine, but scale up as needed. That's my message. With that, thank you so much. And we have three minutes for questions. Yes. You're going to have microphones coming around. OK.
Okay, so, uh, so you've talked about the, wait, I don't see you now. <laughs> Who put that banner here? So you've I'm kidding, about no, don't, don't. I was joking. I don't know, broma, no? In Spanish. <laughs> Gracias. So, you've talked about the CPU throttling problem, and then we've talked about how we can find that sweet spot for uh, defining the CPU and memory limit for Kubernetes, but I have actually seen some people advocate not setting up any limits uh, in Kubernetes. So, of course, you always have the underlying hardware that you need to pick, but for example, if your company offers you a Kubernetes cluster that other teams are managing, you could potentially forget about limits, and I don't know, how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I've seen those discussions. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion about it. I, I prefer to set requests equals to limits, uh, but CPU throttling will always be a possibility, right? The thing is, uh, um, if, if people are deploying pods to nodes that are being shared with other pods, like, like if, if your cluster is like made of four, uh, oh, four CPU VMs and you're deploying pods with 3,000 millicore and that's the CPU request, I mean, you're gonna get one pod per node. It doesn't matter. Because usually 1,000 millicore is reserved for other stuff in Kubernetes uh, on average. Um, so if you do not set a CPU limit, it means that the, app, the JVM will run as if it's a fat server, right, period. Um, and then that's, that's okay. Uh, all you have to think is your JVM process, if there is any issue or max load and there's another pod on that node, that, no that pod may not run because there's no CPU available. Um, for any given time that your Java process is consuming all the CPU time. So it's about scheduling. Um, it really depends. I, I don't have like a general rule um, except the start with CPU request equals CPU limit and see how that goes. Uh, but I think if you don't set CPU limit, I think it's harder to identify issues. Personal opinion. I'm not saying even that our team believes that. Bruno believes that. And I hope I'm wrong. Thanks. More questions? Yes, Ben, sure. Ben Evans. By the way, I learned a lot with Ben on this exercise. He's, uh, he, work, he used to work for Neo Relic, and now, where are you, uh, Ben, working at? Red Hat. Red Hat. Y'all know Red Hat? Uh, th thanks, Bruno. Um, so can you share the benchmark applications you used to conclude that Parallel is better than G1 on small heaps. The reason why I ask is, we did some similar experiments and we saw some evidence that Parallel behaves artificially well on certain benchmarks. Yeah. So I would like to talk to you about this in more detail, but if, you, if you've got applications you can share so we can try and replicate, that would be really cool. So, check my GitHub. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then I'll come and hassle you. That sounds like a plan. Uh, no, there is the, the repo is this one, AKS. Uh, I did these tests on AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service, but it's, it's all Kubernetes vanilla, and this is the code. AKS JVM benchmark. Uh, it's a gRPC service. And I, as you can see, there are lots of YAML files, and I, I hated having to write these things, so I did a lot of copy pasting, and even that did not work, because when you copy and paste, the identification goes nuts. Anyways, yeah, this is the repo uh, you can look at. Um, so here's the thing, um, I, I'm, I'm out, of, out of time, but the, the, f my understanding for why Parallel GC can work better in general for microservices than G1 GC is that for G1 GC to work, G1 GC has to have more, it, it requires more structures. The garbage collector is an application running inside the JVM. It's like, remember Java EE application servers when you could deploy two or more applications? Old days, 1985. The garbage collector is an application running inside the JVM, right? But the, each implementation of garbage collector has some data structures that are different or some stuff that they do differently. 
And G1GC requires some more stuff to operate than Parallel GC. So Parallel GC is a little bit like simpler than G1GC. So that's why perhaps, I think, G Parallel GC will operate generally better in, uh, for microservices than G1GC. Again, in general. It, always benchmark your own application, see how that goes. But don't, going back to my initial slides, don't just believe that the JVM would do the best selection of garbage collection for your application. That is not true. Never was, but we have been tricked by the JVM gods, whoever wrote documentations and oracles out there. So with that, thank you so much.